Welcome to video number two for chapter 33, The Great Depression and the New Deal. Roosevelt had no qualms about using federal money to assist the unemployed, so he created the Civilian Conservation Corps. This provided employment in fresh air government camps for about three million uniformed young men. They reforested areas, fought fires, drained swamps, controlled floods, and the like. Critics accused FDR of militarizing the youths and acting as a dictator. The Federal Emergency Relief Act looked for immediate relief rather than long-term alleviation, and its Federal Emergency Relief Administration, FERA, was headed by the zealous Harry L. Hopkins. Other programs were put in place as well to help farmers meet their mortgages. The Agricultural Adjustment Act is one of those programs. It made millions of dollars available to help farmers to be able to pay their mortgages and keep their farms. The Homeowners Loan Corporation refinanced mortgages on non-farm homes and bolted down the loyalties of the middle class who became democratic homeowners. The Civil Works Administration, or the CWA, was established late in 1933, and it was designed to provide purely temporary jobs during the hard winter emergency. Many of its tasks were rather frivolous and were often called boondoggling, and were designed for the sole purpose of making jobs, even, though the, even if the jobs weren't particularly important. The New Deal had its commentators and its critics. One FDR spokesperson was Father Charles Coughlin, a Catholic priest in Michigan who at first was with FDR and then disliked the New Deal and began to voice his opinions about it on the radio. Another critic, Senator Huey P. Long of Louisiana, was popular for his Share the Wealth program. Proposing every man the king, each family, he said, should receive $5,000, allegedly from the rich. The math of the plan was ludicrous and never would have worked, but it didn't stop him from speaking about it to whoever he could. His chief lieutenant was former clergyman Gerald L. K. Smith. He was later shot by a deranged medical doctor in 1935. Dr. Francis E. Townsend of California attracted the trusting support of perhaps five million senior citizens with his fantastic plan of each senior receiving $200 a month, provided that all of it would be spent within the month. This plan mathematically also did not make sense. Congress also authorized the Works Progress Administration, or the WPA, in 1935, which put $11 million on thousands of public buildings, bridges, and hard-surfaced roads, and gave 9 million people jobs in its eight years of existence. It also found part-time jobs for needy high school and college students, and for actors, musicians, and writers. John Steinbeck counted dogs, which meant he boondoggled, in his California home in Salinas County during this time period. Ballots in newly hand, uh, ballots newly in hand, women struck up new roles and became more visible in the political spectrum. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt was the most visible, but other ladies shone as well. Secretary of Labor, Frances Perkins was the first female cabinet member, and Mary McLeod Bethune headed the Office of Minority Affairs in the NYA, the Black Cabinet, and founded a Florida college. Anthropologist Ruth Benedict helped develop the culture and personality movement with her student Margaret Mead, and reached even greater heights with the, um, with the book Coming of Age in Samoa. Pearl S. Buck wrote a beautiful and timeless novel 
called The Good Earth, about a simple Chinese farmer which earned her the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1938. So even women were making strides in both the community and writing world, as well as the political world. Industry and labor were also a focus of FDR's New Deal reform plans. The National Recovery Administration, or the NRA, by far the most complicated of all the programs, was designed to assist industry, labor, and the unemployed. There were maximum hours of labor, minimum wages, and more rights for labor union members, including the right to choose their own representatives in bargaining. All of these were increased um, benefits for labor. The Philadelphia Eagles were actually named as a result of this program when it received much support and patriotism, but eventually it will be determined as unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. Besides, too much was expected of labor, industry, and the public for this program to really succeed. The Public Works Administration, or the PWA, was also intended for both industrial recovery and for unemployment relief. Headed by Secretary of the Interior Howard Ickes, it aimed at long-range recovery by spending over $4 million billion on some 34,000 projects that included public buildings, highways, and parkways. The Grand Coulee Dam of the Columbia River is probably the most well-known. One of the 100 Days Congress's earliest acts was to legalize light wine and beer with an alcoholic content of 3.2% or less and also levied a $5 tax on every barrel manufactured. So as a result, prohibition was officially repealed with the 21st Amendment. Paying farmers not to farm was also another part of FDR's New Deal programs. To help the farmers, which had been suffering ever since the end of World War I, Congress establishes the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, which paid farmers to reduce their crop acreage and would eliminate price-depressing surpluses. It got off to a rocky start when it killed lots of pigs for no good reason, and paying farmers not to farm actually increased unemployment. The Supreme Court declares this program unconstitutional in 1936. The New Deal Congress also passed the Soil Conservation and Domestic Allotment Act of 1936, which paid farmers to plant soil-conserving plants like soybeans or to let their land lie fallow, which means they did not plant the land at all. The second Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1938 was a more comprehensive substitute that continued conservation payments but was accepted by the Supreme Court as constitutional the Dust Bowl, and the Black Blizzards. After the drought of 1933, furious winds whipped up dust into the air, turning parts of Missouri, Texas, Kansas, Arkansas, and Oklahoma into what was called the Dust Bowl. This forced many farmers to migrate west to California and inspired John Steinbeck's classic, The Grapes of Wrath. The dust was very hazardous to the health, and living through it created further misery. The Fraser Lemke Farm Bankruptcy Act, passed in 1934, made possible a suspension of mortgage foreclosure for five years, but it was voided in 1935 by the Supreme Court and it declared unconstitutional. In 1935, FDR set up the Resettlement Administration charged with the task of removing near farmless farmers to better land. The Commissioner of Indian Affairs also played a prominent role during this time period and was headed by John Collier, who sought to reverse the forced assimilation policies that had been put in place since the Dawes Act of 1887. He promoted the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, which was called the Indian New Deal which encouraged tribes to preserve their cultures and traditions, not simply assimilate into American culture. Not all Indians liked it, though, saying if they followed this back-to-the-blanket plan, they'd just become museum exhibits. 
77 tribes refused to organize under its provisions, but 200 chose to do that. This is the Works Cited page. All of the images used in this presentation are from the public domain.